Hey, what's up, guys? Hope you're doing well. Let's finish up the information for this upcoming test. I'm um, dealing with Chapter 27, Metabolism and Energy Overall, kind of energy usage. Um, when we talk about metabolism, don't forget that overall metabolism is any chemical reaction in the body. So remember, metabolism um, is any chemistry that takes place inside of our body. We're going to talk about it here in just a second, how there's two main forms of metabolism. There is a breakdown process that we're going to call catabolism. And then there's a buildup process that we like to refer to as anabolism. And so we're going to talk about how we can break these subunits that we absorbed, those monosaccharides for carbs, those triglycerides for fats, and those amino acids for proteins. And we can use them to either rip them apart and break them down catabolically to make energy, or we can use them, for example, anabolically to build muscle out of those amino acids for example. And so um, that's really what this chapter focuses on. Now when we get into this chapter, we also kind of, I'm going to repeat kind of the end of chapter 26. So I'm going to talk about each individual nutrient and kind of the enzymes and how they get absorbed. And then we're going to flow into the metabolism. So about half of this is just kind of a repeat of the end of digestion. But this is, I'm going to give you some images from an older textbook that really kind of help us out and visibly give us a good kind of background and a guide to follow. Again, let's don't forget that digestion, we're going to take in these large organic molecules. We're going to eat food. And digestion is going to break down those big organic molecules into those usable nutrients, those subunits that we can actually reabsorb or, or absorb into the body. Excuse me. <clears throat> Again, when we're talking about nutrients, we're looking at carbohydrates, and the goal is to break them down into monosaccharides or simple sugars. And then whenever we talk about lipids, we're trying to break them down into triglycerides, also fatty acids, but our body's going to absorb the triglycerides. And then when we look at proteins, we're trying to break those down into amino acids. Remember, those are the three of the four organic molecules that we focus on for digestion. We mentioned how that the pancreas can actually digest nucleic acids, but we don't tend to use nucleic acids as a nutrition source that much. And so we really focus on the carbs, the lipids, and the proteins. Those subunits, again, not only is digestion important, in the absorption. We get those into the bloodstream and eventually into the circulation. And as I mentioned just a second ago, what are we going to use them for? Two main things. First, catabolically to make energy by breaking them down, and then anabolically to build structural like muscle or functional um, neurotransmitters or um, hormones, you know, or enzymes, things that we just talked about. So building functional components. So we can either anabolically build or we could catabolically break down. So we'll talk about that here in just a second. I don't think we need to focus too much on hydrolysis. Hydrolysis, we're going to use water and that's going to help with the breakdown, the splitting. Don't forget lysis means to split, hydro means water. So the key is if we take water and we break it down into hydrogen plus OH, H plus OH, right? Because there's our H2O. Then we can actually insert the H and the OH in the middle of another molecule where, there, where there's a bond. And then we can add the H to half of the molecule that we split and satisfy that bond that it just had. And we can take the OH and add it to the other half. And so we can use water. We actually split water. And then by splitting water, we can split other molecules. So if there's anything that ever comes up about hydrolysis, it's really a major component of breaking down. That's the main reactions that break things down. Now, again, here is our repeat of Chapter 26, Carbohydrate Breakdown. First, we're going to roll through the enzyme and then we'll talk about how we absorb it. So don't forget, in the oral cavity, we're first going to zap those carbohydrates with salivary amylase. So that amylase is going to break down the starches into groups of trisaccharides, disaccharides, or monosaccharides. Again, the goal is for us to get the monosaccharides because that's what we can absorb into the bloodstream. We can use it for metabolism. But here the amylase is only going to split us into threes, twos, or maybe ones, you know, so it may fit 
that's the job on some of them, but we're still going to have some twos and threes left over, some trisaccharides and some disaccharides. So don't forget that we swallow this when we swallow our food because we chewed it up and mixed it in our mouth. And then um, in our stomach, this is going to continue to work maybe one to two hours. It depends on how much protein you put in the stomach. But as the pH of the stomach drops, that's when we're going to start to activate the proteases in the stomach. And those proteases are actually going to break down the protein that you just ate. But this amylase is a protein, and, it's, and it reacts just like the protein you just ate. And so once the pH drops, it kills that amylase. It breaks it apart, and it deactivates it. So then we're in the stomach. We're focusing on the protein digestion. But as soon as we come out of the stomach, we're going to hit it in the duodenum with pancreatic amylase. From the pancreas, we're going to get almost exactly the same type of enzyme, another amylase. And again, it's going to focus breaking things into tries, dyes, and monos. Once we get the monos into the small intestines, monosaccharides can go straight in. But if we've got dyes and tries, then we're going to have to use the brush border enzymes. Don't forget, brush border. I like to call them the finishing enzymes for carbs and proteins. And so they like to take the tri and the di units here for carbs, it's trisaccharides and disaccharides, and it likes to break them down into monosaccharides. So here, let's talk about three of these, and the key is they, they, can, they can focus on specific sugars, but they can also really just kind of split apart in between specific bonds, and that's, the, that's really the key. Maltase splits apart the sugar called maltose. Maltose, you need to know, is a glucose bound to another glucose. And so glucose to glucose connections are going to be split by this enzyme called maltase. So the enzyme is maltase, and that sugar glucose bound to glucose is called maltose. Maltose. This is, you probably are familiar with this with candies like Whoppers. Um, so Whoppers are called malted milk balls. We're coming up on Easter time. We like to see some of those malted eggs sometimes during Easter. You get that in your Easter basket. And so those, you notice it's a little more powdery kind of sugar. It's not as sweet. It's a little more softer type of sugar. And so there's that maltose. That's really what they use in England more than they use in America um, for their main kind of table sugar. They might use maltose over there. Maltose is extracted from grain. And so I'm very familiar with maltose because whenever I make beer, then I'm going to try to extract the maltose from the grain. And that's what I'm going to provide to the yeast so that the yeast can ferment that and convert it into ethanol, convert it into alcohol. And then that's what makes my beer. And so malt, for example, you may hear of a malted liquor or a malted beverage, and that means that it just used some sort of grain as the base for its fermentation, for its main ingredient. Um, the next brush border enzyme is called sucrase. Sucrase splits apart sucrose. Sucrose is what we use in America as our table sugar. And so this is what you might put in your coffee or you might put on your cornflakes or something. Um, you know, so sucrose, I need for you to know, is glucose bound to fructose. So again, glucose is the main one that we're going to convert everything into once it hits our bloodstream. But this sucrose is glucose bound to fructose or fructose, F-R-U-C-T-O-S-E. And so sucrase is really going to split apart sucrose. And truly all that it does is it splits between the glucose and the fructose. And again, that's our sweet sugars that we eat here in America. Think about, again, a Jolly Rancher versus an Altoid, for example. So an Altoid is a malted sugar. And sucrase is that Jolly Rancher. It's really more kind of powerful sweetness overall. Lactase, you probably have heard something like that. Lactase splits that milk sugar called lactose. So lactase is the enzyme that splits lactose apart. Lactose, I need for you to know, is glucose bound to another monosaccharide. It kind of sounds weird. It's called galactose. It sounds like it's in the stars. But galactose, just put a G-A in front of lactose, and you spelled galactose. So glucose bound to galactose is really what milk sugar is. And so some people, they don't have this enzyme. They can't break milk sugar down quite as well, and so it gives trouble to the stomach and to the intestines and causes overall discomfort, you know, and some issues. So 
This is, again, breaking down that milk sugar, and that is glucose bound to galactose. Again, once we've got all those monos, now we can absorb them right into the bloodstream. We can start working with them metabolically. Carbohydrates, first we're going to zap it with salivary amylase. Then that's going to continue to work into the stomach. It's going to be broken apart, and then we're going to hit it with pancreatic amylase. This is going to create our dyes and our tries and our monos. If it's a mono, we're good to absorb it. We don't have to modify it anymore, but if it's a dye and a try, then here on the tips of the villi, we're going to use the brush borders, maltose, maltase, sucrase, and lactase, and that's going to help to break those down so that we can absorb them into the bloodstream. Now let's look at lipid breakdown real quick. Lipids, again, we're kind of doing the same kind of concept as carbs. We're going to hit it before and after the stomach. And by hitting it before and after the stomach, we kind of overall break it down well enough. Now there's really only one lipid breaker downer, only one lipid enzyme, and that is lipase overall. So we're going to zap it from the tongue, lingual lipase in the oral cavity. Same concept as salivary amylase. It's going to continue to work into the stomach until the pH drops below four or so. And then that's going to digest that lipase. But as soon as we come out of the stomach, we're going to hit it from the pancreas one more time and keep breaking it down. But here, not only are we going to zap it with pancreatic lipase, we're also going to add the bile. So don't forget, this is coming from the liver and the gallbladder. And these bile salts are going to help and then allow that lipase to do more digestion. Now, as I mentioned, because our body's mainly water and this is fat, it doesn't like to mix, so we've got to disguise the fat. We even rename it. We call it a chylomicron. So these chylomicrons, I need for you to know that this is a triglyceride bound to a protein. So we're hiding the the identity of this lipid by kind of disguising it with a protein and then that way we can try to slip it into the body a little bit easier. Now again, I mentioned this before, these chylomicrons, they're absorbed into lymph capillaries. They're absorbed into lactils instead of being absorbed into the regular circulation and they get delivered later. And that's part of the reason they get to roam around in that heart. And then before they get to the liver and get checked, and that's part of what gives us all that heart disease that is not good. Again, here's that um, layout lipids. Lingual lipase in the oral cavity keeps working into the stomach. We dissolve it, we kill it, and then we reactivate it with some pancreatic lipase and some bile salts. That's eventually going to break us down into some other things, but the goal is what we can absorb in are these triglycerides. So again, it doesn't matter what it breaks it down into. We've got to rebuild it into a trig, bind it to a protein, call it a chylomicron, and then we can absorb that into the body, and we absorb it into that lactyl, that lymph capillary. Proteins are a little bit more difficult. Um, again, we need to do a whole lot more mechanical digestion with these proteins. So we're going to hit it with the teeth and the tongue and the palate and the oral cavity. We're trying to rip and shred to expose more surface area for the enzymes and the acids. The stomach as well is going to be involved with churning. Same thing, the duodenum has a little bit of mixing, not necessarily churning, um, but there's our last little bit of mechanical would might be down there towards the duodenum or the duodenum. In the stomach, we're going to zap it with hydrochloric acid. Acid, and we're also going to zap it with pepsin. Don't forget that hydrochloric acid is both a physical and a chemical kind of breaker downer. Um, but part of it is that it activates the pepsin. So it activates pepsin, and pepsin is going to be our main protease. So remember, the proteases uh, are going to break down the bigger proteins into medium sized proteins. And then we're going to have a group of peptidases. Now, I notice that some of these may show up, so you may want to just know this list trypsin, chymotrypsin, elastase, and carboxypeptidase. These are the four that we're going to consider to be the peptidases overall. So these are going to take our medium chunks of proteins and break them down into tri peptides, dipeptides, or individual amino acids. Again, the goal is to get individual amino acids to go straight into the bloodstream, but if we got dyes and tries, then we're going to zap them with those brush borders. So our last enzymes are brush border enzymes, and these guys are going to come into the small intestines, and there they're going to do the finishing job. They're going to break the dyes and the tries into the individual amino acids, and then we can get those into the bloodstream and start breaking it down. Oh, excuse me, start using it for metabolism. 
Again, here is that, that nice little image protein. We don't really see anything happening until we hit the stomach. And stomach is the focus, right? So we're going to mechanically digest up here, but then we zap it with pepsin. And that pepsin is really the main protease. They like to use the word polypeptides. And I've been kind of dumbing it down just a little bit and saying medium-sized proteins. And so then we hear, we see our peptidases and these peptidases are going to take those medium sized proteins and then they're going to break them down into our tripeptides, dipeptides and individual amino acids. If we've got individual amino acids then we can just absorb them straight in but I forgot to mention we need those brush border enzymes to finish it up right so they're going to take the dyes and the tries. I forgot to mention you should be familiar with exo and dipeptidase. Exopeptidase dipeptidase. These are the two brush border enzymes for proteins. And when they're finished, um, they take the dyes and the tripeptides and they break them down. Exo just, you don't have to know it, but exo snips the one on the end and dye always snips if it finds two together. And so then that way we're going to break them all down into individual amino acids and absorb them into the bloodstream. Now again, the goal here is to discuss what happens when we get them in, and that's metabolism. Metabolism, again, is any chemical reaction in the body. We've got two main forms, catabolism and anabolism. So catabolic versus anabolic. Catabolic reactions are breakdown reactions that are going to produce energy. So a catabolism is going to take, for example, that that glucose and we're going to rip it apart we're going to make ATP out of it and that's really kind of the goal for when it comes to carbs but when it comes to proteins we don't want to use those for energy that's not a very smart move we want to use those to build new organic molecules and that's really more of an anabolic process to take those amino acids to build new neurotransmitters to build new hormones that's really kind of the goal that we're doing again to build something is going to take energy so we all need to undergo a catabolic process to make some energy before we're able to build something by using some of that energy. Here's just a simple kind of breakdown. If we've got a molecule called AB, we break it down into A plus B and we're going to release energy. And the opposite is true. If we add A plus B plus energy, then we're going to get the molecule called AB. So we kind of see catabolic versus anabolic. Last note over here is whenever we break something down, we don't capture all of the energy. We only capture about 40% of it. Again, 60% of that energy is going to be lost. Anytime we have a loss of energy, this is simply just a law of thermodynamics, is that heat, heat is the form of lost energy. And so usually when we talk about lost energy um, in physics, we talk about heat and we talk about sound. And so we're not really concerned about sound inside of the body, but that heat, um, this is what we talked about before called the calorigenic effect, how some cells and simply just burn energy to produce that heat. Um, this is also another indication. If, if you have something that produces a lot of heat, then you know it's not very efficient. So like our cars, crank those jokers up, and then all of a sudden it's the engine gets hot, right? And we got to start using that radiator to cool it down. And so our cars are not very efficient. They lose a lot of that efficiency in the form of heat. Again, this is good though. This is what your muscles do. They use that ATP and they create a loss of energy in the form of heat. And then that's what heats our body up to 98.6. I'm not too concerned about this image here. But what I do want to focus on, again, we kind of talked about this. Whenever we're building besides creating energy, we're going to do maintenance. We're going to do repair. So we've got to just keep up with what we're doing and make sure that our house isn't falling apart, make sure our body's not falling apart. We always like to term that metabolic turnover. So metabolic turnover is the process of um, where we just kind of maintain what we've got. And so um, that's really kind of once we hit our full growth, um, that's really kind of what we're going to do for the rest of our life is kind of maintain what we've got. And remember, as we get older, everything craps out, right? So that's what we've learned over and over is everything craps out because our metabolic turnover starts to slow down eventually. So the key, as I mentioned, first we want to support growth. We want to make sure that we reach that adult size. Um, and then once we reach adult size, we're going to have to maintain. So we're part of maintaining is secretions, making secretions. A lot of times we've already mentioned neurotransmitters and hormones and enzymes as three very important secretions that are mainly protein-based.
And if we've got extras, we're going to build nutrient reserves. You know, some of us, um, speaking from experience, myself, have too much nutrient reserves where we've maybe consumed too much and then we like to store it in the form of fat, you know. Um, so um, mitochondria, let's mention that real quick. Um, these kind of topics we just hit, we're really focusing on more anabolic kind of information. Now, this mitochondria is really more or less involved with catabolic types of information. So remember, the mitochondria is what we're going to run that glucose through. Basically, whatever we eat, we're going to, you know, if we need to use it for energy, we tend to have to convert it into glucose. And that's part of the problem on these low-carb diets is that you're forcing your body to convert another nutrient that's intended to be used for something else and you're trying to convert it into energy and the problem with those diets is when you do that you make the most toxic chemicals your body can make. This mitochondria, very important to break things down. It always wants to use glucose plus oxygen and that's where we make ATP. So that's kind of the secret to the mitochondria. You can write it like an equation, right. glucose plus O2 equals ATP in the mitochondria. Now, again, here we can kind of see this graph kind of demonstrating some of these things. It's very complicated. Um, we can kind of see this metabolic turnover with catabolic and anabolic and kind of just regaining um, our normal maintenance overall. So you can pause that and take a look at that if you'd like to. That's not really going to show up on the test, though. Here, this is really kind of cool. This is showing us the mitochondria a little bit, and I always like to mention this. Um, here we see this mitochondria has two different membranes, and whenever we take the from these two different membranes, brains, they're actually completely different. And so this mitochondria is support for kind of how we think that cells were created called the endosymbiont theory. And what that is, is how one cell ate another cell. And it's kind of like how we eat probiotics and they live in our intestines. Well, one cell ate another cell. They, one cell was making a whole bunch of energy and another cell was not. And so this bigger cell decided that, hey, if I ate this other cell that was making a bunch of energy, then it gives me a symbiosis with this cell. I can start to use its energy. And I'm kind of protecting it because it's inside of me. And so here we started to see these basic symbiotic relationships on a very small level. When we take the DNA from the outer membrane, if it makes sense to you, this should be from the cell that ate the energy producing cell. And this is actually the DNA that we code for. So this is coded by our own double helix, those chromosomes that we have. But whenever we take the DNA from this inner membrane, we notice that this is actually coded by a completely different type of DNA. This is actually coded by circular DNA. And if you've been in micro, then you know that circular DNA is a telltale sign of bacteria. And so here, this circular DNA is more of an, uh, more of an archaic, um, you know, bacterial DNA. DNA. Um, but what's interesting about this DNA is this DNA is only passed through females, only through mamas. And so um, what we have come to realize is that we can use this DNA to trace everybody's mama's mama back to their first mama, right? And so we can use this to 23andMe and Nat Geo and find out who our ancestors were and where we kind of broke off in different lineages um, as we migrated out of Africa. And so we can even trace this back and we can kind of see originally um, before we really did this work, we thought we'd trace it back and find one woman who kind of started all this and we entitled her Mitochondrial E but whenever we traced it back, we kind of found seven different women that most of all humans, or that all humans basically came from, all modern humans came from. We can see where they migrated. Um, some of them, it all started in South Africa, Southeast Africa, and it kind of migrated up and started to move out. And we can use these different tribes and these different um, lineages and when they moved out of Africa and kind of see where you're related and how far back we can determine who you're related to because certain people branched at certain times. So kind of use that as as landmarks in our in our time frame to kind of figure out who you belong to. So if you've done that 23andMe, this is really what they're focusing on is that mitochondrial DNA. And you know that's really kind of a really cool concept when we talk about biology. So sorry I just geeked out on you guys. Um here, carbohydrate metabolism. Let's bam through this stuff and be done. So 
we got to do carbs, we got to do lipids, and then we got to do proteins, and we're finished um, with metabolism. Again, as we mentioned, we're starting with glucose, c 6 h 12 6 And again, that is an isomer, so that's also fructose, and that's also a couple of other these of these guys. But whenever we look at this, glucose is really the main animal sugar that we use. I want you to know that glucose makes 36 AT. I know right here it says 36 to 38. There is an alternate pathway, but we're not concerned with that. So let's focus on 36 ATP. So one glucose makes 36 ATP, right? Well, that's that's good, right? I got 36, right? Well, what does that mean? Uh, I mean, I don't know. How much do I need, right? So when we talk about ATP, we haven't really talked about how much it takes to do stuff. And we're not going to get into details, but if you take your arm and you just flex your bicep back and forth a few times, you just use 10,000 ATP, for example. So you can use up ATP very rapidly. So one tiny little glucose giving us 36, we're going to need a whole bunch of that glucose, okay? So that's the reason in a balanced diet, as long as you're active, you tend to need more carbohydrates than you do any of the other um, organic molecules. So that 36 ATP is really what fuels our whole body. Now there's three main steps, and here's how I want you guys to know it. I'm not going to make you know too many crazy tales, but I want you to understand the concept. First off, we have glycolysis, and if we break this word apart, glyco means sugar, and lysis means to split. Here's the here's the deets that you guys really need to understand, though, is that glycolysis is a prep stage. All that this is is a preparatory stage. This takes place in the cytoplasm. So inside of our cells, remember the goal is to get into the mitochondria to get most of that energy. But here glycolysis is a prep stage to just get into the mitochondria to begin with. The big problem, glucose, we see it here, C6. It's got six carbons. Well, six carbons is too big to fit into the mitochondria. And so as a result, we need to split that glucose and we split it into something else. And I want you to know that glycolysis, it is a prep stage, takes place in the cytoplasm, takes glucose, and it splits it into what we call two pyruvic acids. Sometimes you see it called pyruvate or pyruvic acid. And so a lot of times we see that kind of common Probruvate or pyruvic acid, glutamate, glutamic acid. So we see that kind of commonly um, when we've talked about things before. So again, glycolysis takes a six carbon sugar and it rips it into two three carbon pyruvic acids. Now the pyruvic acid is what can enter into the mitochondria. And once we're in the mitochondria, we've got two steps. We've got the citric acid cycle, also called the TCA also called the Krebs cycle. And so the first intermediate in this process is citric acid, right? So vitamin C. And so overall, the citric acid cycle, we're going to use a lot of these molecules and we're going to recycle them. But we're going to use that pyruvic acid from glycolysis to fuel this cycle to keep it going. So I want you to know, here's the main information. For the TCA, this takes place in the mitochondria. But this is not going to release a bunch of energy. The TCA, it's similar to glycolysis in that the citric acid cycle is simply just another prep stage. So this is the first stage in the mitochondria for carbohydrate metabolism, for catabolism, to make energy out of it. And citric acid cycle is going to be um, in the mitochondria, and it is a prep stage to enter the ETS, sometimes called the ETC. So the electron transport system or the electron transport chain. And so what this is going to do is it's going to use what the citric acid cycle made while it was prepping. It's going to use those molecules and it's going to extract ATP out of those molecules. It's not really extracting ATP. It's going to set up a gradient and use a hydrogen gradient to kind of fuel almost a water wheel that makes this ATP um, form overall. So the key, ETS, this is in the mitochondria and it produces all the ATP overall for a carb. Okay, we're going to make just a little bit in these other two cycles, maybe two of two to four out of that 36, but 32 out of that 36 is really made in the ETS overall. Now, 
To finish up carbohydrate metabolism, we've just talked about the breakdown, the catabolic reaction. Now let's talk quickly about the anabolic reaction. Again, I mentioned this. If you're on a no-carb diet, then this is what you're forcing your body to do. You're fo forcing it to undergo gluconeogenesis. This is misspelled. There should be an E right here between the N and the S. Um, you know the spelling of genesis. Genesis means creation of. Neo means new. And gluco means sugar. So really what gluconeogenesis is, is a good definition is it's creating glucose from another organic molecule. So we're going to use another one, a lipid or a, car, or, or a protein, and we're going to convert those into glucose. And again, that's what you try to do on these low-carb, low-carb diets is to convert those amino acids, that protein, into sugar. So gluconeogenesis is that process. All right. Again, we're about to talk about that. Whenever we undergo that process of gluconeogenesis, we're going to create some of the most toxic chemicals that the body can create. Here, you don't have to know these details, but here is glucose. In the long run, we're going to end up with pyruvic acid when we undergo glycolysis. So again, here, this is very complicated dealing with these molecules and the enzymes that catalyze their reactions. So don't worry about that, but just know glucose, start, excuse me, glycolysis starts with glucose and ends with pyruvic acid. Here's that Krebs cycle or citric acid cycle. We're going to get pyruvic acid in. Again, our first intermediate is citric acid or vitamin C. And so here we're going to start reusing these molecules and adding the carbons we get from pyruvic acid. And we're just going to keep this cycle going. But I want you to notice what we make are these red NADHs. We like to call them NADs and FADs. Here's an FADH2. And so these NADs and these FADs, these are actually, the way I want you to think about them is they're ATP creators. So each NAD creates three ATP and each FAD makes four ATP overall. You don't have to know that detail, but you need to know that the NADs and the FADs are what we're using from the Krebs cycle, the TCA cycle, and then we're going to use those in the ETS, in the electron transport chain. Here's what I was mentioning. We're going to build up a gradient of hydrogen between the two membranes in the mitochondria, and when we allow those hydrogens to enter the inner membrane, it's going to catalyze the reaction, and it's going to create our ATP. So here we can see ADP, diphosphate, we're going to add a phosphate, and we're going to make triphosphate, ATP. All right. A lot of details there. I want you just to be familiar with the basics overall, though. Here's another view, kind of putting it all together, pointing out that we really only get two from glycolysis, and then over here we only get two from um, from uh, uh, overall. It seems like we only get two from TCA, and then we're going to get most of these 32 from our um, actual electron transport system. Again, here's another view, taking um, glucose and breaking it down to pyruvic acid. You can see that arrow shows us glycolysis. But here we've got an opportunity to put in amino acid. Over here we've got some of the fats, and we can put those in and go the opposite way and turn them into glucose, and then that's called gluconeogenesis. So there's our anabolic reaction. Almost finished, folks. Only two more slides. Lipid metabolism. Okay, so let's kind of put the pound a little bit. Lipid metabolism. When we talk about breaking it down, one fatty acid makes 144 ATP. Holy crap, one fatty acid makes 144 ATP. Well, I got a whole bunch of ATP just wrapped around my body, right? So why don't I just use all that ATP? I don't need to eat. I just want to use my fat, fool. How do I unlock that? Well, what's the problem? We're, we're what? What are we two-thirds? Water, right? What is not mixed with water? Fat right? Don't forget that metabolism, chemistry takes place inside of our water. That's why we're mainly water, is to have chemistry undergoing inside of it. So we can't just mix a fat with water. Oil and water don't mix. And remember in our body at 98.6, most of these fats are dissolved, or excuse me, they melt. And so they are kind of liquid. They're not solid. And so this is really the main key. If it produces so much ATP, why not just use lipid metabolism? And the problem is that we have to put our bodies into certain situations, certain conditions to be able to burn these lipids. So we have to really focus. Um, one of the main things that we can do, you know, we talk about aerobic activity, but also one of the main things when we burn lipids is during recovery after exercise. We, our muscles like to use lipids in order to um, kind of as the fuel to help rebuild those proteins. So that's one reason, um, you know, we do drink some carbs. We need to drink some protein after we 
work out, make sure that we can replenish that glycogen with the carbs, but make sure that we can replenish the muscles with that protein. And then that way um, we can use those fats and that will help make us leaner. Now again, something else that likes to use fat more than other structures are our muscles as well. So building muscle will burn more fat compared to not having more muscle on the body. So definitely something to think about if you're trying to get rid of some of that um, love handles like I was talking about. So here we've only got two processes. We got lipolysis and we got beta oxidation. And so lipolysis, it sounds like glycolysis and it's extremely similar. Again, this is a prep stage. It's in the cytoplasm. And what I need to do is break this fat down so we can fit it into the mitochondria, into the pores, into the holes, into the mitochondria. Once we break it down as a prep stage um, and we get it into the right form, we get it into the mitochondria, and here's our only stage in the mitochondria. This is called beta oxidation. This is what's going to release all the ATP, that 144 ATP per fatty acid. And so beta oxidation is going to be um, the main thing that's going to create the ATP there in the mitochondria. Whenever we're building fats, so for example, if you eat too much candy before you go to bed, your mama said it'll make you fat, right? Well, it does. We can take carbs and we can convert that candy into fat. So we can convert candy into fat by lipogenesis, converting, again, another organic molecule into a lipid is called lipogenesis. Just like gluconeogenesis, we can create things into sugars, but we can turn other things into fat. If we eat too many um, carbs and we don't burn them in a day, then it's going to be stored eventually as a fat. And so that's what we are kind of built for is that long-term storage. But again, we've kind of taken ourselves out of that natural selective process in nature. And so now we don't really see leaners and we don't need that fat to keep us bulked up during that winter and to slowly lose weight during the winter. And then first meal we eat, we bulk up real quick. So we're kind of back to that, that usual weight. So, you know, our body's have kind of moved away from that type of metabolism, but we still, we eat too much. And so as a result, we build a lot of that fat. Here, whenever we see these long chains of carbons and hydrogens and very, very little oxygen, well, that's definitely a fatty acid. That's how we can tell a fatty acid, big long chains, very little oxygen, bunch of carbon and hydrogen, then there's going to be the fatty acids. Again, here's just another image kind of showing us some of the different things that we can build and some of the different ways that we're going to use these um, molecules. Last thing to wrap it up and kind of get finished with this is protein metabolism. Protein metabolism, again, we mainly think about proteins for building. You know, that's really what they need to be used for is for building. But for some reason, we've got some of these people pushing these diets that really focus on trying to use proteins for fuel instead. So let's talk about that, the catabolic reactions, the breakdown reactions dealing with proteins. One amino acid produces that tilde, don't forget in math, that means approximately. So it produces approximately the same energy as a carbohydrate. That's what the CHO means. So it produces 36 ATP, right? So that's what we need to know. Let's do some math real quick. If carb ma if a glucose makes 36 and an amino acid makes 36, then 36 times 4 is 144. And that's how much a fatty acid makes. So a fatty acid makes four times as much ATP as either an amino acid or a carbohydrate or a monosaccharide. And so our body chooses to use proteins before it chooses to use lipids. And that's part of the issue. If we don't put our body into specific pH and temperature ranges, then it's not going to burn fat. So if we're not eating carbs and we're eating a bunch of chicken breast and that's it, then you're going to be using those amino acids to break down and to create the energy where you would usually use sugars. Now the big issue here is there's two different ways that we can break that down. So here's a process. It's not a one, two, three. It's an either or. We can either transaminate or we can deaminate. Again, let's break this word down. What we're doing, trans, means to move, right? To move the amine group. So we're going to take the part off of that amino acid that gives it the name amino. We're going to take the amine and we're going to take it off of that amino acid and we're going to bind it to another molecule. So we're going to move it and we're going to attach it to somewhere else. So this is probably the best thing that we can do. We can take this 
we can take the amine group off of one structure, add it to another, and that's going to release some energy. The big problem comes in this one, deamination. And unfortunately, whenever you overflow your body with protein, this is what you're going to start doing. You're going to start deaminating. So that just means that you're going to rip that amino acid off, and because you don't have anywhere else to put it because you've already added it to all those other extra molecules, you're just going to have to let it float freely. Okay. Now the big problem, amine is NH2, um, and then if we add two more H's, we get ammonia. And so that's where ammonia comes from, is from amines that are floating freely, and they just bind extra H's. And we know there's a crap ton of H's just hanging out everywhere. And so as a result, we're going to form that ammonia. Ammonia is the most toxic chemical that you can make in your body besides hydrogen peroxide. And so ammonia, if you drink it, it will kill you, right? So you never heard anybody say swish with ammonia, have you? No, you clean your toilets with it, right? So it is a deadly kind of substance to drink. So again, we don't want to make too much of that in our body. The big problem is when we make too much ammonia, we force our liver, and I want you to know that. The liver has to take the ammonia and it deactivates it. It deactivates the ammonia and turns it into the number one waste product in our urine. One of the main reasons we even have to get waste out. It means we create urea. And so ammonia in the liver is created into urea. And so the liver is taxed whenever we're on these low carb diets. But not only is the liver taxed, but now we're also taxing the kidneys because we're producing extra waste product that forces the kidneys to work faster and harder. And so this can cause uh, cause renal failure, cause renal damage. So even Atkins, the, one of the original guys on these low-carb diets, he went to the hospital on um, big major problems dealing with renal failure and dealing with liver failure, liver issues, because of his own diet. And he actually had to get off of his diet before it killed him. Um, so definitely not a good thing. Um, anabolically speaking, again, this is kind of the key, it's protein synthesis. This is what we're using this for. Don't forget that DNA is the code, and DNA codes for a protein. It codes for all the proteins that our body can make. DNA is the big code. RNA just kind of transcribes that code, and it takes it out to that ribosome, and then we can build. Now, this number has changed. This is old school, 100,000, 140,000. I've seen 300,000 proteins that we've identified that our body can make recently. And so um, our body can make hundreds of thousands of different proteins, and again, we can just build them out of amino acids. Now, there's more than 20 amino acids in nature, but we as humans only tend to use 20. So there's actually a couple more, but we only use 20 of them. And I want you to think about this as like telephone numbers, except for instead of 0 to 9, we got 0 to 19. And so, and it also instead of 10 digits long, we can be as long as we want. And so that's really what a protein is. How we arrange these amino acids in different orders and at different lengths creates a totally different protein. And as we've talked about, proteins are important for both A and P. They create the anatomy, a lot of our anatomy, and they create a lot of our function, our physiology. So super important. Now, usually these amino acids are hanging out of the cytosol, inside of the cytoplasm, the gooey stuff on the inside of a cell. And whenever that RNA shows up at the ribosome, it just kind of, we've got these other molecules called transfer RNA that's going to bring those amino acids out of the cytosol as all and to the ribosome and then we're just going to link them together and as we link them together we form those peptide bonds and then we create the actual proteins now to finish this up we've got two different versions two different types of proteins essential versus non-essential um, it is essential that we eat the essential amino acids so that's a good way to remember it Essentials you have to eat, non-essentials, our body can create these. We can take another amino acid, and we can snip and clip it, and we can turn it into the one that we actually want. So there's a few, I, I forgot the total number, maybe seven or eight essentials that we always have to eat, and then there's also these non-essentials. And in the long run, this is also... Um, for a long time, it was very difficult for um, vegan athletes to build very big muscle because essential amino acids that are in muscle help to build that muscle. You've heard the old adage of you are what you eat. Um, up until the previous Olympics, there was not really a major vegan athlete 
But then the U.S. had an athlete, a vegan weightlifter that won the heavyweight division. So kind of interesting. He kind of shattered that whole tip. But at the same time, essential, you got to eat it. Non-essentials, you can build it from something else that we've already eaten. Um, here's just kind of showing you transamination, taking that NH2, taking it off of one thing and adding it to another. But here we're starting to see these keto acids also. And we know that that can cause ketoacidosis. And again, acidosis is when your body drops its pH and that's not a good thing. We're going to start to have some bad reactions. Here's that deamination. Here's the worst. NH2, just kind of cut it off and let it flow freely. We've created ketoacidosis, and now we've also created ammonia. So two of the things that we don't need our body to do are created by low-carb diets, right? It's right there in front of us, so we can't deny it. Um, here, again, is kind of an ending kind of um, picture to kind of wrap it all up with the lipids and the carbs and the proteins. But at that point, we've kind of finished our talk on metabolism, and that's going to complete everything for our fourth lecture test. Make sure that you have watched all of these. Make sure that you have taken good notes while you've watched it. Rewatch it whenever you need help and you need to rehear a topic. And then if you've got any questions, you can always email me or discuss it during our class time. Um, and don't forget that I've also added those extra outlines and notes with the study questions that can help prepare you for the test. So take a look at our schedule and make sure that you're getting ready way ahead of time so you're going to be really prepared and you're going to kick this test butt. All right, y'all. Love you, mean it. Peace out.